Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Photography Chat with Merlin, uh, Season 2, Episode 44 with uh, Sarah Stilino. Uh, we will get Sarah in here and then we can get the chat go. Hope everyone's having a good time. Hey Tim, how you doing? Hope you're having a good week. Hey! Hey! How's it going? Good, how are you? I'm not too bad. Let's get this. So you're on vacation? Kind of, yeah. So work told me that uh, I had to take some time off because I had too much time left over um, that I hadn't used yet. And uh, had a couple things I needed to do in Toronto anyway. So um, decided to um, go to sunny Toronto for vacation. Nice. Because you live Vancouver. I have no idea, like, where they're at in Canada. Um, yeah, so um, Toronto is, like, just north of Buffalo, New York. And uh, Vancouver is, like, uh, just north of Seattle. Okay, gotcha. I figured they were far apart, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, and I used to live in Toronto up until uh, May of this year. And then I moved out to Vancouver, which is where I used to be from originally. And, uh, yeah, it's nice to kind of come back and visit with old pals and, uh, check out places that, uh, I used to frequent all the time. Yeah, totally. I bet you what, I'm, I feel like I moved, I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm from there. I moved to Chicago for a while. And when I came back, I was like, oh, I love Madison. Mm -hmm. But when I had only lived in Madison, I wasn't the hugest fan. Yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. So I was I was born in the West Coast, grew up out in the West Coast, and moved to Toronto in 2017. And uh, always kind of missed the West Coast and was just like in a real rush to get back. And now that I'm back over there, I was just like, man, I really miss Toronto. <laughs> uh -huh. And like coming back here, um, just even like little things like, the traffic and the drivers here are pretty bad, but nothing compared to Vancouver. And I got stuck on some highway traffic and there was some like, you know, real fuckery that like went on in front of me that usually would be like road range inducing, but it was more like, oh man, Toronto, I missed you. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is kind of funny. How long yeah. were you in Chicago for? I was there, I'd say maybe four years. Nice always have time I was back and forth between Madison a lot so but Chicago's cool too I I've wanted to spend more time in Chicago like I've got some friends that are out in Elgin or Elgin yeah yeah uh, Elgin. yeah and visited them there a couple of times which was uh pretty cool but uh had planned to spend more time down there before COVID kind of ruined that mm -hmm. idea. <laughs> Yeah, that was when I moved back to Madison. My wife and I were living in Chicago, and when COVID happened, we were like, well, we want to move to Madison, so it's a good time to do it. Yeah, interesting. So how's the, <laughs> how's the switch been going from, like, Chicago back to Madison? It's been really good. She, she was ready to get out of Chicago. I was, too, so... The only thing I, that's kind of a bummer is our climb. We like to rock climb. Our climbing gym here is a lot smaller than Chicago. Oh, uh, maybe it's time to build a new climbing gym. Yeah, <laughs> two of them, but they're small, and Chicago has like five, and they're humongous, like warehouses. It's crazy. Yeah, Danielle says Wisconsin girls represent. Yeah, <laughs> she's awesome. I haven't gotten to hang out. She has. She knows a bunch of people in the Milwaukee area. And they get up and like meet up and I haven't been able to get out there, but I've met up with Danielle. Danielle, she came to Madison and it was super awesome to meet other photo people because I've never met up with anybody else who shoots film other than Danielle. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, Danielle is awesome. I interviewed her a, a little while back this year and it was just a real like, pleasure chatting with her. And, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's cool seeing what she's been working on uh, with the film sorority and stuff. And, mm -hmm. yeah. How, 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 oh, sorry, how, go ahead. She's been making embryo types that look so cool. And I want to meet up with her and see how she does that. 
or something. Yeah. The Ambrio types look wicked awesome. Like, yeah. It's, it's cool when people work on the alternative process stuff. Mm -hmm. Her Halloween ones, oh man, they were crazy. So spooky. Oh, you're making her have cry emojis. <laughs> <laughs> she says Sarah is the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want like anything scary. So like seeing those Ambrio types of like creepy dolls, that's like as far as I go. Yeah, I'm kind of like m like midway on on the scary stuff, but um, yeah, my partner of sorts, she's not a, a scary scary stuff fan either. Hate it. Yeah. I was I was scared by goosebumps as a kid, so threshold. Really? Yeah. R. L. Stein was just too much. Yeah, everything was. Was it just like the was it the Polaroid one or like just all of them? I don't think I I don't know what that is. I couldn't handle it. He had this one where it's like a creepy Polaroid that would like, if you had your picture taken with it, you'd die. Oh, crazy. Yeah. I, <laughs> that's kind of funny. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of interesting that you've, um, Danielle's the only film photographer you've ever, um, you know, run across. So like, how long have you been shooting film for? Um, I got into it when I was in Chicago. My grandpa or my grandma gave me her dad's film camera and I hadn't shot film since like I took one class in high school. And I was like, oh my God, this is so much fun. And um, well, I mean, the whole story is that then I kind of went down the rabbit hole. And at the same time, I was like, had a crazy huge crush on my wife. And she had no idea, so I was like, that's when I got back into portraits because I wanted to take photos of her. So I bought like a Pentax 6.7 and like went all the way down. You see, yeah. you bought a 6.7 before you had to like remortgage your house to get one? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I probably still paid too much for it, but I didn't know anything, so. It's kind of crazy how, how films, like as you go down that rabbit hole, it's a like dangerous and expensive rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's really bad. I should like uninstall eBay on my phone. And <laughs> place. It's just fun to look. And I don't even like to like, I don't have a ton of cameras. I hate to see them sit. So I'm always, oh, I could sell it and then use that money towards something that I'm like excited about. That's an important thing is to get, get excited for sure. Like, I um I had I had a really bad um attack of gas when I first started like getting back into photography stuff like around 2017 because it hadn't gotten crazy expensive yet and Toronto had like a really excellent used uh, like market so it was just like I was on Kijiji which is like our Craigslist and like Facebook marketplace and it was just there was like all of these things that I always thought I could never afford and they were like there and they're so cheap mm -hmm. but then I kind of felt bad because like I had all these things and uh wasn't using all of them so I've just kind of been like slowly selling them off and stuff how many do you have right now do you know oh man um at the peak I was at like 500 cameras whoa but there's a caveat around that um I got up that high because I bought like five boxes of cameras off of this lady. It was like her husband's collection and like he'd passed or something. And in the pictures of it, I saw like a few cameras that I really wanted. Uh -huh. um, and I kind of like looked at her asking price and I was like, that's less than what those like, you know, five cameras I wanted that I could see from the pictures were. So I was like, it's worthwhile to buy this whole lot just for those like five cameras. Wow. <laughs> and were they, like, what was that? Were they in good condition? Um, the ones that I wanted were in, in decent condition, but then there was just like, you know, basically five boxes of shit. And, mm. um, you know, I, I was able to like pull like, I think maybe a dozen or so like decent cameras out of it. And uh, I had this tiny apartment in Toronto that was like now dominated with these like massive boxes of cameras that I didn't want. Um, I ended up selling them to a guy that does like movies here and he like used them for props and stuff. But um, usually like, like the, the highest without the ridiculous boxes of cameras was I think I was like around 
like 65 cameras and uh i'm i'm probably like maybe 35 40 right now and those are ones that i mostly use i sold a bunch though to camera shows so i haven't really counted but then like you know as, as like the gear acquisition goes i'm on vacation and i end up buying another camera while i'm here oh, really? <laughs> okay. um so since i've moved to vancouver and it's been hard to like find a film lab that i, I like there i started shooting digital a little bit and i really wanted a fuji x pro 2 um and i couldn't find one for a decent price in vancouver so i ended up getting like a fuji xt2 out there which is still a really nice like mirrorless digital camera mm -hmm. um, but you know because i have a problem like you say with the ebay app like the facebook marketplace is like a disease and i was looking on there and i saw someone had an x pro 2 here for a really good price and it was like a rare graphite color that was like kind of hard to find so i picked uh this guy um just the other day and it's been a lot of fun like it's a very different camera from the xt2 um even though they're like the same like the internals and everything are the same so it's like the same sensor and like the same processor and all that they mm -hmm. have a very different feel on how they both work and it's been kind of cool getting to know this guy over the last couple of days cool that sounds awesome yeah, the, the digital rangefinder is kind of a neat thing. Um, it feels like dirty, though, for a couple of different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Uh, well, I kind of hate Fuji is a big one. Oh, yeah, I remember you saying that in a different episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm mad at them. Um, and so liking these cameras now has been a bit of like a, I have to eat some crow on mm -hmm. it because uh, I still hate them a lot, but they make a hell of a decent camera and their glass is amazing. And like, that's something that I'll never take away from them on that. Like um, I've got a Fuji GW 690, like the six by nine rangefinder um, mm -hmm. format, which the glass on that is like magnificent. It's a great camera. Um, a, a new pal of mine, who's been shooting for, for decades in Vancouver, when he used to do eight by 10 stuff, um, he swore by Fuji glass and uh, people thought he was kind of crazy for like, you know, they're like, oh, what are you shooting on there? He's like, oh, I got a Fujinon. And they're like, why the hell would you have a Fujinon? He always thought they were super underrated. So As they're, they're good, that they were like his bread and butter. That was his go-to. Yeah. Loved shooting the Fuji lenses, he was like, they're wicked over uh, underrated. Um, and like back then, I guess they were like a good price. I don't know. I haven't really looked much on what large format lenses are going for right now. Cause my four by five is pretty out, outfitted right now. But um, when I go down the eight by 10 path, I'll probably learn how expensive that is the hard way. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not very technical so like I never like go down the rabbit hole of, like different brands and like different I don't know lens property of, of like specific lenses but I think I have why well, actually my 8x10 I think I have a Nightcore oh those are nice mm -hmm. I got it from KEH it was super nice and I thought it was decent decently priced too so I mean, I also just like the Nikkor because, like, I'm a Nikon fanboy, so you know that. <laughs> that yeah. Also pays out too. Um, I don't know a whole ton about gear stuff either myself, because, like, I'm, I'm still kind of like new to getting back into like the photography stuff, and like, only been doing the film stuff for a couple of years now. Um, so it's, I don't get really all excited too much by like the tech specs on things because i'm just like mm -hmm. make cool photos then awesome i yeah. don't really care more past that yeah but some people really love like you know going nuts about um the the technical details and how important gear is and i don't know i don't think i don't think gear really matters as much as just making stuff mm-hmm Totally. You have to enjoy your gear, but like beyond that. 
Yeah. Yeah, like, I don't, exactly, you have to enjoy it, but I don't think, like, you know, if you go out and spend um, all the money to buy a Hasselblad or something, it's not going to make your pictures better. Like, if, mm -hmm. if you can't make a decent photo with, like, a disposable camera. Totally. Disposables are fun. Like, I feel like I tend to be way more on the large format size, like, or side, like, that's what I enjoy to shoot, so I don't shoot a lot of 35 or even medium format, but... I, um, when my wife and I got married in March, we bought a ton of disposable cameras, not a ton, like seven or something, but, and just like used them all around like the day and like the whole experience. And it was really fun. Like I did not realize how much fun disposable cameras are because I haven't used them like since I was a kid. Disposable cameras are a really good time. And if, if you had fun with, with that, if you want to, um, sort of relive that experience, but not have like the the garbage that comes with like you know the typical disposables. Mm -hmm. um, the Lamography reusable camera is a really cool one because it's basically a disposable, but you can reload it over and over, and um, so there's like a lot less waste because you can use the same camera like probably mm -hmm. a few hundred times. Like I've put like maybe like 25 rolls or so through the one that I have so far. And like, I mean, it's still just as crappy as it was when I first got it. Cause it's a disposable. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> it still takes really cool pictures. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's got like the plastic lens and everything. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's basically a di disposable camera with a flash. Um, but you can still reload like you or you can reload it on like a regular disposable. And it also has some like gels that you can put over the flash too. So if you're shooting uh, color film, you can use the gels to like, you know, do some funky color effects. Cool. That's fun. Yeah. And they're not bad. Like I think they're like 30 or 40 bucks or something, um, which like isn't bad to buy like the plastic camera and a roll of film with it. Um, mm. So it's definitely worth checking out if you like experimenting with that every once in a while. But I was curious, the, the camera that you were first given that sort of like ignited all of this, like what, which one was that? It was a Canon AE-1 program. Nice. So pretty classic. That's a super classic. That was kind of what got me started too. My mom had just a regular AE-1 um, that my father had given her a couple of years before I was born. And there, yeah, the AE-1, that's a real classic. Yeah, it's fun to have like, well, it's now it's broken, but it's like you won't give it away because I'm sentimental like that. I like to keep stuff like that. Well, depending on what's wrong with it, I'm sure there's someone that could probably fix it. I brought it into Central Camera, that place in Chicago once that like the rewind, the top part keeps coming off. OK. I'm still kind of using it, but it's not super reliable. I just know that if anything's being weird i'll just like save it and put it in a dark bag and try to figure it out because i've i ruined one roll of film that way that i was like really excited about mm. Mm -hmm. that's a shame so how did you make the leap though from the canon ae1 into large format like that's a big jump i went to medium format for i picked the pentax by seven because it's just like a giant slr so it's like yeah it seemed way less complicated than figuring out like a Hasselblad or like a TLR that just seemed confusing to me. Um, but so after trying a bunch of like medium format stuff, I think I was probably just looking at more photos on Instagram and like looking and seeing what people were taking the photos with and a ton of the um, portraits, cause I'm always most interested in portraits were all taken with large format. So, I kind of like started looking up stuff and I found one, some dude was like getting out of large format on eBay and was selling like his entire setup and I got it at a decent price. So I think that was during quarantine. Which so one was your first large format? I had a um, Wista. Yeah, I'm just looking at it here on your Instagram. And yeah. it was the wooden Wista? Uh-huh. I'm jealous. It was, it was very pretty. Oh, you don't have it anymore. No, I actually, um, I think it was just, well, two big things. I was like ready to get out of 4x5. I was like, maybe I should just do 8x10 and like shoot even less. 
because it's way more expensive. Um, but I ended up finding a really good deal on a Chamonix that I couldn't pass up. And I got a lens that's like slightly, um, the maximum aperture is a little bit more than 5.6. So that combined with a brighter ground glass, it was way easier to see. And I felt like I missed focus a lot less. Mm. So that's kind of what like reignited my interest in 4x5. That's fair. Mm -hmm. I, I'm jealous of the wood one though. Like uh, Ariel is in here. She's like woohoo Wista because she just joined the Wista gang recently. Oh, cool. Um, but uh, she's got the same sort of like just the black metal Wista that I have, the 4x5. And I absolutely love that that camera. It's a cool, cool company. Do you like the metal? Because it's like clamshell, right? Yeah. So it just, it folds up inside yeah. of itself and it's, it's like super portable and, um, I really like it. Like it's, um, I didn't like, it was a camera that found me. It's not a camera that I found. Um, but I ended up really loving that camera a lot, traveled a ton with it. Like I took it all over Canada in the U S. Um, cause the guy that gave it to me, um, included like this low pro Magnum bag. That's like the perfect size for carry on. So Ooh. it's like, I could have like my backpack with a couple of days worth of clothes and the Wista in the, um, carry on bag and the tripod fits on the side of the bag. So I could fit like a few film holders or like some pack film in there and like take it out. And it's, it's a cool, cool setup. That's awesome. What kind of photos do you like to take with your four by five? Um, mostly portraits. Yeah. yeah. Which is I a weird thing because like most of my photography is street photography. Mm -hmm. um, and I, <laughs> I tried taking um, a couple street photos with this in Toronto and I almost got ran over. <laughs> oh, it takes a long longer to um, make a photo with a four by five than it does to take a photo with a 35 mil or even a medium format. So um I'd be like, okay, I could totally do this. I, I would like mark a spot in a crosswalk and be like, okay, I'm going to stand here and I can totally like, you know, get this all set up before it changes again. And uh, a couple of times did not make the light change and was like having to run out of traffic with the camera. Yeah. Was it a busy street? Uh, kind, yeah, kind of. So. Yikes. Poor choices. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then when I started traveling with it, um yeah the first big trip i took it to is policon uh in denton texas and um i have like a a decent uh pack film stash and i was like i need to use this film um instead of just having it like rotting in my fridge so i bought i, I brought a bunch of pack film down with me to uh, uh denton for the policon and um was uh I, I sold a couple of pack film portraits for some people and gave a ton away to like my, my pals down there and stuff. And I was just like, this is really fun. Like doing the, the um, instant portraits with it. And mm -hmm. uh, I took it to Elgin, uh, my friend, Brian, or yeah, uh, Brian, uh, who lives in Elgin. He's a uh, theory of a Brian on Instagram really fantastic like instant uh film um creator and he was having a um a show there at the side street studio called uh, before your eyes and it was like a instant film um uh kind of celebration and show and so he had like all these different uh instant film uh, photographers that were participating in it um yeah, you know, he had uh, Jason Lee send some stuff in. Uh, Sarah Jean Acor um, from Ohio sent some stuff in, and she was there. And it was really cool to like you know, get to meet her because we've been following each other on Instagram uh, for for so long and talking on that. So it was neat to like interact in person. And uh, so I brought the Wista to Chicago to Elgin um, and was doing portraits there too of, uh, of people that were there and. So yeah, I really like doing the portraits with the the Wista. Mm -hmm. And it's, some studio work. I've done a bit of studio stuff with it and that's been a lot of fun too. I've tried to make like a makeshift studio once in our old living room, but it went okay. I, I'm usually just out of my elements in a studio. 
I am completely out of my element <laughs> with oh. the studio, but um, I've been lucky to have some like really talented friends that are um, very, very strong, competent models that are just like, we kind of like what you do with this stuff. So like, let's do some collaborations and we've been able to make some like really cool stuff but it's mostly because of their talent and really <laughs> all you just have to do is like be a facilitator exactly yeah you know, i'm just there in the moment where while well, they're creating this hot fire and i'm just capturing it with my camera that's awesome makes it so, easy so was the wista your first um large format or um was it you went eight by 10 and then tried four by five and then like went back to eight by 10. No. So I went, Mother Wista was my first and I kind of messed around with that for a while. I like figured out developing at home. That's like, I bought a Patterson tank and all that good stuff. Um, but I think it might've been the beginning of this year. I was considering eight by 10 because I've kind of realized that about myself. I just like continue down the rabbit hole until there's, nowhere left to go but so i got an 8x10 and i did like it i was having like some developing issues i was trying to do tray developing um but i was getting like development marks and so i was getting a little discouraged i was gonna get out of 8x10 but um my mentor herb who is in the area he's the one who like got me reacquainted with the local community dark room here um he was like, you shouldn't get out of eight by 10. So he convinced me not to. And I'm actually really glad um, that he did that. I just took his portrait recently, which I haven't showed him yet, but I'm super excited to show him that. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of eight by 10 was it that you, uh, you picked up and you've been trucking around with? So I picked up one that was pretty lightweight. It was like a brand called BDS, which I hadn't really heard of. Um, and I just sold that and got one that was actually less expensive, but it's a little bit more heavier duty. It's a Agfo. Agfo, what's the second word? I'm totally blanking. Ansco. Ansco. Mm hmm Eight by ten. Those are cool. Ans that's uh Ansel Adams used to rock Ansco. Oh cool. Yeah. But yeah, I wanna try to do wet plate at some point, so I figured that'd be better suited. If you're curious about wet plate stuff and if you head to like the Chicagoland area um, much at all, um, you should look up Doug Hansen art on Instagram. Okay. He's an Elden too and um, he's an excellent tintype um, guy and like he does tintype workshops and stuff. Okay. And, um, he's like intense about his tintype workshops he's like he'll show you how to make tintypes and then you just make tintypes until you hate them <laughs> that's awesome yeah and he like awesome. he taught uh he taught brian how to do tintypes because like brian's also like a really talented tintype photographer and like that's he learned it from doug and some other workshops and so yeah there's there's lots of like resources if you want to jump into that kind of stuff not far from you for sure I'm definitely dying to do that. We just moved, so I'm without my dark room right now. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm working on creating a dark room in our basement, but I'm getting my stepdad and brother to like help me figure out how we're going to build walls and that kind of stuff. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like more of a rare thing I guess now like hearing about people making dark rooms I guess it was a lot more common like way back in the day where like people have like dark room spaces and mm -hmm. now with like digital and like labs and stuff like that it's just easier to have someone else do it it's so fun I really enjoy it I I miss the dark room a lot so like I haven't had my own dark room but I used to be part of a community dark room um in Toronto and uh i miss printing a lot like that was um that was like a lot of fun for me was like doing um that kind of stuff there was the the printing and yeah nico's right kodak does offer workshops for alternative processes but you know it being kodak you have to like you know give up like a firstborn child or like you know, <laughs> to uh to pay for those <laughs> workshops <laughs> 
they come with a price. Doug, mm -hmm. Doug workshops a little more um, pocket friendly. Mm -hmm. And closer. <laughs> yeah, and, and closer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine Chicago would a little, be a little closer than Rochester. Mm -hmm. I used to make that drive all the time. It's no big deal. Out to Rochester? No, to, <laughs> to Chicago. <laughs> oh, that's. <laughs> I do. Um, actually, I love going on road trips, so that wouldn't be too bad. I'd like make it one trip one day. Well, if you ever need an excuse to go to Rochester and you want to do something cool, um, you should follow Matt Stoffel um, on Instagram. If, if you don't follow him already, Matt, I think he goes by like Stoffel Matt underscore on Instagram. And um, he's um, like a, a really wicked awesome dude that works for Kodak, but he runs their factory tours and, and a bunch of other stuff there. And oh. um, when they open up factory tours again, like it's it's the best. Like I think it was like three hundred and fifty bucks or something like that for it. But it's like you had to spend the whole day there, and like they give you some free stuff, and um, it's just really cool though to like see where film is made and how film is made and. Um, you get to talk with like the engineers and the people working there and, and stuff like like who've been there like some of them have been there like you know 20 30 plus years or they're like fourth generation Kodakers it's like you know they're their daddy's daddy's daddy you know working <laughs> and it was really interesting to like walk around there and like um, hear their stories and see where where film kind of came from that would be super cool someday for sure yeah, and they do have a huge museum there too. Um, the East, like the George yeah. Eastman, yeah, yeah, the George Eastman House, um, and it was also kind of cool, like seeing the Eastman House and the head office there. So um, Eastman, being like a really rich guy, was also a very eccentric guy, and um, he put this pipe organ in his house, but apparently his house wasn't big enough for the pipe organ to sound right. He needed the house to be bigger. So instead of adding an extension to his house to make up for the space, he cut part of his house off because he liked the way that that looked and he didn't want to ruin that part of it. So he's like, I want to cut this piece off and move it the distance we need to move it to make up for the rest of the space and then build a new chunk to make up for where we cut out. So he like split it and built in the middle? Yeah, so he split it, moved it down, and then built in the middle because he didn't want to ruin the aesthetic that had already been built. He was just like, I like this already the way it is. Um, and then that eccentricity carried on into Kodak Park. The original administration for Kodak Park was a two-story building. And when things started getting busier there and they're doing more business, they needed more space in the admin office. Um, so instead of doing the logical thing, which was like, well, let's just build another story on top of the two story building. He's like, well, my office is there. I like how my office is. I don't want my office to be tainted or have to move my office. So he had a new foundation built for the building in front of the building so that there'd be a new first floor and then move the two story building on top of the new thing. Jeez. So that his office was still the top, the top one, and he didn't have to move his office. He just moved the entire building onto a new platform. And so it's really weird when you see the administration building because there's these weird, like, pillars that come down for, like, it looks like it's the front door, but uh -huh. they're on the second story. And oh. it's like, well, because that was the front door when it was a two-story building. But <laughs> when they made it a three-story building, it just became part of the facade. That's crazy. You wouldn't even think that possible. I mean, he had the money and the means to make it possible. So um, really interesting guy. But it was also kind of like a, it was weird going through Eastman House because like it was all, I was all excited and it was like cool to see all this historical stuff. But then I had forgotten like a big thing about George Eastman, which was that he killed himself in the end. And uh there's like a part of the exhibit where they go over like, you know, um, what, what happened to him. And uh, he was dealing with a bunch of health issues and his family had like a, 
history of like health issues and, and, you know, people becoming crippled and things like that. And he did not want to go out that way and his body was starting to fail him. So he decided instead of waiting for nature to, uh, to do it, he just did it himself. And wow, I did. what's that? I did not know that. Yeah. He, uh, he went out with uh, with a real kind of not necessarily a whimper, but definitely, well, also a bit of a bang because he did use a gun. But he just wrote a note that just said like, "I'm done, George," and uh, that, that was kind of it. Yikes! Yeah, but yeah, I mean, he, he'd built a pretty epic empire um, up to that point, and he had alluded to that too. Like he was out with his like general manager or something like that and at Kodak Tower there's an elevator that goes right up to the spire and the door um like when when the elevator doors open you're just like out in front of the like the elements and everything and um he was up there with with his like general manager or something and they were surveying um the work that was being done at Kodak Park and uh he just like they were basically done that phase of Kodak Park and he just kind of said to the guy like you know my my work is finished and then like you know shortly after that he uh he decided to just like completely finish it off wow I bought that book that talks about like the whole Kodak Polaroid like the legal battle between them but every time I try to read it it's well it's always at night and it's so dense that I end up falling asleep very quickly <laughs> So you bought it as a sleep aid is what you're saying. Yes. I'm like 30 pages in. I've had it like over a year. Which book is that one? It's, um, God, I'm not even sure where I have it now. But it's about the legal battle between Edwin Land and Eastman Kodak. I think it might be a biography about Edwin Land, and that's kind of like a big part of it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, Kodak, it was really interesting because Kodak and Polaroid had a very deep intertwined history for a long time. Because mm -hmm. um, Polaroid originally started just making polarized lenses. Like, that's where the name comes from, Polaroid, because they were making uh, Polaroid, uh, polarized glass lenses mm -hmm. um, for all types of purposes. Like, there was even, at one point, they made uh, polarized headlamps so that when you're driving at night, yeah, yeah. you wear polarized glasses so you would not see the glare of, of headlights because they thought it would like reduce accents and stuff like that. Like it's some really interesting stuff. Um, but Kodak had made the negatives and some of the positive materials and a lot of the, the film materials that Polaroid used for their instant films for quite some time until Polaroid started making their own facilities to make their own um, mm -hmm. products. And even after that, for some of their specialized stuff, uh, Kodak was still making like negatives and stuff. And some of Kodak's management thought Eastman was crazy for agreeing to like, you know, making it. And he's like, whatever, like, you know, these guys are small and like, I'm gonna take their money. It's like money's money. Right. Um, but then Polaroid no longer was small. They became a, a titan in their own right. And uh, Kodak invented a really good way to get in a really bad lawsuit with Polaroid. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's almost like exactly where I'm at in the book. Pretty much that was a great summary. So I, maybe I should start reading again. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets really interesting from there because like, yeah, it's, it did not work well for Kodak in the end. Mm -hmm. For Kodak, really? Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's like one of the largest recalls that uh, that happened on a consumer product. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting story, um, and and you know, Doctor Land is he's a fascinating dude. Like even the story of Polaroid is really cool. There's some really great books on on Polaroid, and you know, he he was a real sort of genius visionary. Like he he would have been like Steve Jobs and Wozniak in like one one person kind of thing um, but he was also why polaroid ultimately ended up failing like mm -hmm. you know the reason they were so successful is also what ended up killing them in the end because he created this world that could only be run by daddy and 
when daddy was removed from the picture, it completely fell apart because there was no one to actually run things. And mm -hmm. he was just like, well, fuck you guys. Um, you kicked me out, so you can just like fail now. Yeah. I'll definitely start reading again. Yeah. Um, the, I think it's called Land's Camera is like the, the one book that I really enjoyed about Polaroid. Um, oh shit, not uh, Land's Camera book. Uh, I can't remember the exact name of it and all of my books are back home, but like there was this one book that was made um, by one of like his senior management that was like really, really great because like it went into like the inner workings of like what Polaroid was like and it, it, it didn't run like a normal company, like they ran it more like a research and development uh, firm that just happened to make consumer products but like most of it was like let's just try doing crazy things and see what happens and see if something sticks uh -huh. um, just because we can and you know just for science like um, when he tasked the the person um, who made the color uh, Polaroid film um, the guy was like I spent two years just researching what happens when you mix colors together before I even started working on making the film, because if I just jumped straight into making the film, um, Land would have shit on him for it, because he's like, I don't want you to make the product, I want you to become an expert in what I want you to work on before you start working on the thing, because you need to understand it intimately and completely before you can start working on it, so that when you start getting deep into it, you have like a pool of knowledge to draw from as you start getting into stumbling blocks. So he's like, I don't want you to figure it out as you're doing it. I want you to figure out a bunch of stuff and then start doing it. Uh -huh. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah. A real fascinating like company and just a fascinating man. Um, you know, we could use more like visionary people like that in, in the world today. Uh -huh. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so, at the, and it, it's more of an interesting read. I didn't really find it um, like boring at all. Um, another good one was Instant, the Story of Polaroid. That's a more recent one. And that was a really, really cool book that kind of had a bit of the history of um, like a bit more of the recent history of like Polaroid failing and like what actually killed Polaroid in, in like 2008, which, yeah. you know, not cool that they failed. But. A bit of a spoiler alert, a Ponzi scheme was really what killed Polaroid. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What? How yeah. so? Oh, sorry, was that? How so? Um, so, like, when like Dr. Land got removed from the company and they started, like, having other people try and run it, and this is, like, a sort of TLDR, so it's not completely exact, but... He was removed from the company and they're like, we can find other people to run it. And uh, a series of like engineers who were, because he created this ecosystem where he was number one, there was no number twos, and there was just like a series of threes that existed in that ecosystem. And all of those threes needed permission from daddy to do things. They couldn't just work autonomously. And so they removed land and all of these threes who have always needed permission to do anything and never really did anything on their own were stepping up to be like, I can do this, I could run things. And there was just a series of failures by all these people because they just didn't have the gumption to actually step in and fill his shoes. And um, through those series of failings, that also affected the company financially because each time someone failed, the company hemorrhaged a ton of money and their market position slid down even more to the point where the bank started stepping in and being like, well, obviously none of you have any idea how to fucking run this place. So um, yeah. we're going to step in here and save this asset before it's completely obliterated. And so they brought in this dude who on paper looked really fantastic because he had this like hugely successful real estate business uh, and I'll just say hugely successful real estate business in air quotes um, because 
it was a massive Ponzi scheme. And uh, he scooped up the, the opportunity to lead Polaroid because even though Polaroid was not in a great financial position from like a cash reserves perspective, they were very um, real estate rich because anytime they opened up an office or a new factory or something like that, they always bought the property and the land and the buildings outright. And so they owned them. So they had like huge real estate assets all over uh, the world. And this guy saw that and was just like, this is the blood money that I need to keep my Ponzi scheme afloat so I can continue to look successful. So he started selling off um, a lot of Polaroid's real estate assets and then funneling those proceeds into his scheme. And he got caught and him getting caught is why we still have Polaroid today um, because the last factory in the Netherlands was set to be destroyed, but it was around the same time that he got indicted and had to go to the Supreme Court to, you know, show up there in court. And so they paused the destruction of the building while that was happening. And it gave um, Dr. Florian Capps and his investors a couple of days of room to find money to buy that factory before it got destroyed. And um, that's why we still have Polaroid today is because uh, Florian Caps was able to raise enough capital in those like couple of days while the destruction was paused by the factory and then spend a bunch of time rebuilding the bits and pieces and reformulating everything so that we can have Polaroid again today. Wow, crazy. That's like a movie or something. It, it, so they have made some movies <laughs> and they've been really interesting. Um, but sadly, like none of them have been like the kind of riveting documentary I thought it could be about like all this like crazy stuff that happened with the failure. They've been very like, um, kind of out there, um, like conceptual, like art kind of documentaries that are, they're fascinating in their own right. And they're really great watches. Um, I think one's called like instant dreams and, uh, that's, that's a pretty cool one, but it could make a really cool movie, like, you know, Silicon or Pirates of Silicon Valley style kind of thing of like, you know, the Steve Jobs versus Bill Gates kind of war. Like, it would be kind of cool to see like, you know, the Polaroid story of like, you know, maybe a, a fast forward history sequence of like um, the growth of Polaroid and the battle between Polaroid and Kodak. And then like, you know, the final years of Polaroid being torn apart by this Ponzi scheme and then the swan song that became impossible project. So it'll happen someday, I'm sure. Just maybe it. one day. And oh. Paul is absolutely right. Your work is beautiful. I meant to comment on that earlier. Um, your portrait uh, work is just stunning. And before you started getting into um, the large format and medium format stuff, like, had you done portraits before? Or this was just like your for like first foray into it? Um, I had done them like maybe intermittently, not really anything seriously. I went through like that whole phase, not long after first taking a film class in high school, you know, then you get a digital camera and you're like taking senior portraits of like friends and stuff. But that kind of ruined it for me. It just felt so canned. So, I mean, that was like my only other experience doing portraiture, but the large format like workflow I feel like really changed everything for me just because it's like so slow that I think about it a lot more so that's been really helpful nice yeah yeah the, your your portraits have like a really beautiful feeling to them um which is something you don't see often in in portraits and I think it's something that you, you get from using like a the like a large format style kind of thing like um have you ever looked at any of dave rollins work no um so dave is another fantastic film photographer um he's out in the bay area in california um he's on instagram as synodar and oh, yeah. um, never mind i know who he is <laughs> you, okay have, yeah. have you seen uh, the the book that he just put out Yes, I have to get it. It looks so cool. It is. It's amazing. Like, um, 
not just because like me and a bunch of like new photo pals are in it, um, but you know, the Dave's work in it is exceptional. Like um, I think he's an Aero Ektar for most of them on, mm -hmm. um, on his uh, uh, graph, graph thing or graph lines. Okay. Yeah. And um, that was the first time I met him. He was doing some portraits for that series in Texas in 2019, uh, or maybe it was 2018. Fuck, I can't remember now. COVID so he's been working on it. Together. What, what's that, sorry? So he's been working on it that long? He's been working on it for a few years. Like, cool. he's, he's, he was traveling around, um, taking pictures of photographers. Um, he was like, you know, hitting up some people in California as well, too. And uh, it's, it's beautiful. Like, um, you know, he's, he's a very modest dude. But um, I, I believe he deserves some like some big praise on that one, because the, the book turned out excellent. Like, yeah, it's worth every penny. His portraits and his photos have like a certain feeling to them, too. I don't know what it is, but they like really make you pause, you know. They do. Um, he's really good with getting those like really beautiful blurred backgrounds, but still having the subject being like really front and center of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I like how in, in a few of them, they're, I don't even really know how to, de how to describe it. It almost like feels like they're barely just standing out of the, the background, but they're still very prominent. Mm -hmm. uh, and the photo he took of me is like hands down like one of my most favorite photos anyone's ever taken of me um <laughs> like when he showed it to me he was like holy shit man that's that's fucking amazing like yeah I can't, I can't believe you you made this of me well you totally like feel how engaged the like the subject is with the camera so like you feel that connection i feel like that's why they're like so prominent too Hmm. Yeah, because you, you do have to spend more time when you're taking a photo of someone with a large format camera. So there's a lot more engagement there. And maybe that's part of like the, the magic of some of these um, like the portraits is like the, the time spent as the portraits being created, like, you know, building a connection with that, you, you maybe see more of that in the photo. Mm hmm. I just saw Paul's question too about like spending a lot of time with the people that I photograph. That's definitely something I've wanted to focus on, especially with like the series that I just started, the Queering Rural Spaces. I was talking with, I think the one of the most recent people I took their portrait and I was just explaining to them, like I want it to feel a lot more than just like transactional. Like I don't want it to be like I show up, like we find a good spot, take your portrait and leave. Like, I want to spend the day together and, like, talk to you about, like, your experiences and, like, your viewpoint, your outlook, and just, like, really connect with somebody. And I feel like you can feel that in a portrait, too. Yeah, that's actually really cool. I like that because I feel there's a lot of photographers out there where it's a lot more transactional, where it's just, like, you know, they hit up someone because they think they'd have, like, a really interesting look and they want to take their pictures or, um, you know, someone hit them up because they like the aesthetic of like what their photos look like and, and they'd like some of those photos. And um, it's really important to build that connection with someone before you start doing like any kind of like photography. Mm -hmm. I've kind of realized that about myself. I took a workshop recently and we were like, I was talking about it. I just feel like I don't, I take my worst portraits when I'm like showing up just to take a portrait. Like I have to have like a reason or something like I'm exploring or they're exploring. Otherwise I just feel like maybe uninspired. I don't really, I don't really know. Yeah, I, I can kind of relate to that. And uh, Paul says here, that's true. It's awesome. It shows near portraits. They look comfortable with you. Um, and I think that's the really important thing is having having that comfort, not just with like them being comfortable with you, but you being comfortable with them. And um, 
like people photos is something that's still relatively new to me. I've only been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, but I've been kind of picky about who, who I've taken photos of with it. Um, where it's most like most of the portraits I've taken have been like friends and people that I, I already have a connection with. Um, but I've had some people reach out wanting me to do photos with them and I'm like, well, maybe let's do a coffee first and just see if we like get along as people and uh -huh. if like, you know, our ideas kind of jive together before we start trying to like create anything. Cause if, if that's not there, then we're not going to be able to make much. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Cause even just taking photos of somebody who's like, LGBTQIA or queer or however they identify it's like or really any person I feel like I have to know you in some way in order to try to portray you authentically I don't know I just like without that you're pretty much just like taking a picture which is fine too but it's just not my jam and I, I have done some stuff like that where it's just a picture like um, one of the things I've I've been practicing just to get more comfortable with shooting people um, is that I like to give away um, instant photos a lot. Usually in stack squares because I'm not made of money and I can't just give Polaroids out for free all the time. Yeah. Um, but if I'm like walking around on the streets, I have like a Lomo instant square camera that's usually always in my backpack. And if someone has like a cool look or something, I'll be like, hey, do you want like an instant portrait? And um, most of the time people are like really cool about it. Sometimes like, what, what the hell do you mean? And other people are like, no, like fuck off. Um, but I'll just take a photo of them with the, the Lomo and give it to them. Like I have no copy of it. Like it's, they get to keep it. So it's not weird for me because I'm not keeping something I don't have a connection to. It's like just something that they get to keep and like, you know, they have a connection with it because it's like you know it maybe it reminds them of that moment that a weird bearded man showed up out of nowhere and gave them an instant photo <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's also been kind of cool because with friends because uh, when I catch up with people that I haven't seen in a while um, I use my my Polaroid um, SLR 680 for this usually um, I'll do two photos of them um, I kind of back to back I'll take like two portrait photos of them with the um, SLR 680 <clears throat> and then I say you get to pick one that you enjoy and you get to keep that one and I get to keep the other ones so that we can like both have like a piece of this moment that we can remember that's kind of cool I like the two I do also think it's super interesting like just looking at photos of a person and seeing what one they like of themselves the most I feel yeah. like it's Really different than what I pick which is interesting yeah and, and that's where it's been kind of fun is like you know I always be like we're gonna play a game I'm gonna take two photos and then you get to pick which one you want to keep and it's always been interesting to see which one they they pick because um it's different with some people like I've had some people where they're like I don't like the smile on this one as much but I want you to have the nicer smile one so that you can like remember me like that or <laughs> some people be like I look way better in this one, so I'm keeping that one because <laughs> I don't want to see this, like, you know, janky-ass photo of me, so you get to keep that one. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Interesting different sentiments, too, like whether they want to keep the one they want or they're giving you the one they that they think that you want. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, like, it's also, like, as, as much of fun as it's been for me to, like, be able to have photos of these people who are important to me and these memories like like something to attach to a memory so that like as as my memory starts to fail me which is already starting to do um maybe this will help me remember those things it's kind of cool to have that but it's also been like an interesting exercise in just seeing how people react and, and what they do in in that moment and um and polaroid's been a great um medium for that I have not used any Polaroid, but they do seem fun. I haven't used them like since I was a kid. I think if you were to jump into Polaroid, the one that I would suggest for you to muck around with would be the SLR 680. Um, I, I wouldn't 
say you should play with anything else because um, where is it here? This guy. I, I would recommend like pick up an SLR 680, um, probably like eBay or something like that. And, and why I think this you would love this one the most is because it's, it's an actual SLR Polaroid. So when you're taking the photo, you're actually looking through and seeing what the camera is seeing. And oh. you have a lot more control with it in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, it has a, a flash that um, shits out more lumens than the sun provides. <laughs> like it's, it's a hellaciously dangerous flash. Um, but it's great for taking portraits. Um, so if, if you are interested in Polaroid, I would say look for one of these guys, the SLR 680. They're a beautiful camera. And then they like, they have the cool party trick of like folding up and yeah. becoming really tiny. Um, but then if you do go down the route of getting um, an SLR 680, I would always also really recommend um, picking up the Power Ranger from Resobot. It's a little um, battery pack doohickey that um, lets you use iType film on the SLR 680 without having to modify anything. Because huh. there's two types of film that Polaroid makes. Well, three types. They make SX70 for the SX70 cameras, which is a 160 ISO rated film. Uh, they make 600 uh, film which is the 640 ISO rated film for cameras like the SLR 680 and their box cameras and things like that. And then they make iType film, which is a 640 ISO film. But iType is different than the other two because um, the other two um, have batteries inside of them. So the film is like, you know, five, six bucks more a pack because of that battery than it is the iType film because the iType is made for their new cameras that um, have batteries built into the camera. So you don't have to worry about having a battery. Um, so this is like kind of a, a cool um, thing because without having to heavily modify the camera, you can use the iType film because you can attach a battery to it. And um, you know, all you have to do to the camera is he sends you a leather punch and you just poke two holes in the bottom here so that the two contact points can interconnect and you just kind of put it on there and it bolts into the tripod hole. And now you can shoot iType film on the camera and away you go. And Nico says there's cheaper alternatives to the Resovot. And there are cheaper alternatives, but the cheaper alternatives um, are kind of more permanently attached to the camera. I like the Resovot one because you can remove it from the camera and still use it normally. And you don't have to have it on there all the time. Um, the other ones are like a bottom case that you remove this bottom case and bolt on this other one that sticks out a little bit longer and then you have a battery on it. But um, it also turbocharges the shit out of the camera because this is like two more volts and a few more amps than like the batteries that usually go inside of these. So the flash is a little bit brighter and the motor sounds like it's on like nitrous or something when it goes off. Like the first time it ejected the dark slide, it scared the shit out of me because it was so loud. It's just like, I don't know if it's supposed to be like working this fast, but I think you'd really dig one of these for doing portraits because they're, they're so much fun. I'll check them out someday. We actually, so when we got married, I found a film photographer and he brought, I think he had that Polaroid and it was really fun to have all the photos from that. The other thing that's kind of cool with the SLR 680 specifically is um, it's one of the few cameras that you can shoot in complete darkness and um, still get pretty indecent focus photos because it uses sonar for its focus mechanism. Uh -huh. So it doesn't need to have any light to focus the photo. It just, if you point this at a subject in the dark that you want to take a photo of, it'll bounce sound off of it, focus on them, and then poop the sun all over their face and give you a beautiful photo. That's great. I did not know. Yeah, it's, the, the sonar thing is an interesting part because um, Polaroid used to be a defense contractor for the military in wartime. Uh -huh. And 
they made a bunch of things for the US military. And one of them was missile guidance systems. And uh, the sonar in that camera is a distant relative to the missile guidance systems that Polaroid created for the US military. Great. Yeah. yeah. I'll get, I'll probably try it someday for sure, but I'm already spending too much money on large format film. I just started trying color. I got my first color photos back. I took them on four by five. What kind of color did you shoot? Um, I shot, I think it was Portra 400. Okay. Yeah. So you went straight to the Cadillac of color film? I did. Well, I, I shot Ektar recently. We went on a road trip to Colorado this summer. And I don't know what it was about that particular role, but I really did not like it. So I was... You didn't like the Ektar? Yeah. I've shot Ektar before, but... The eight by 10 color, I found an expired box that I bought just to try, but I don't anticipate uh, shooting a lot of color. I like black and white better, which works out. That's me. fair. Have you ever tried shooting any of the um, paper positive? I have not. I do want to try that. It's kind of fun. I shot a little bit of on the four by five. Um, but it was a little hairy because I think it was like like six ISO or like eight ISO. Like it was it was a bit gnarly. I did get some X ray film for eight by ten just so I could try to shoot a lot and not spend so much money. But I wanna figure out my eight by ten developing. I do I bought a bunch of like metal tanks. So once I finally get my dark room up, I can try to figure out that whole process, but I haven't tried it yet. There's, let me see if he makes them that size. Um, there's this guy, um, Bonet Photo, he makes um, bees reels, which his four by five reel is like one of the best um, things I've found for doing four by five, but I don't know if he does it for eight by 10. Um, let's see if he does. Um, yeah, the, the bees reel for four by five, though has been super cool because it just fits inside of um, the Patterson three reel tank. Mm -hmm. and, um, it makes it so that there's like no way to um, destroy like the film. Like I tried using a couple of other kinds of uh, things and it, it just didn't really didn't really work as good oh he doesn't do eight by ten it goes up to five by seven and nine by twelve so we have nine by twelve but not eight by ten In i, do, I oh, watched sorry. seven two the ansco i just got they it had a five by seven reducing back on it so i do want to try that too Ooh. I would also maybe hit up Dave and ask him on um, any recommendations on 8x10 developing, because I know he does a lot of large format developing, and he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to um, comes to that stuff. Yeah, I'll definitely ask him. My 4x5, I feel like I'm pretty decent on. I know a lot of people don't <laughs> like the Mod 54, but I haven't had any issues with it, so <clears throat> it works pretty good. The Mod 54 has boned me a few times. Really? Yeah, so in what way? They popped out, and then I opened it up, and a bunch of my sheets were just sticking to the walls of the tank. Mm -hmm. And That's... so it was like, damn you, Mod 54, yeah. never again. Do you do inversions like that? I'm very, very like, gentle, because I didn't want them to pop out, but, like, it still, I guess, wasn't gentle enough to have them not pop out. I always use the swizzle stick or I have, I bought this like 3D printed, um, not like a Jobo, oh, but like a tumbler? I, yeah, and I'd like spin it myself. Okay. But that's worked pretty good. I ended up just buying the bees reel four by five because uh, you sort of, you put the sheets in as like tacos into this like drum and then the drum perfectly fits inside of the three reel tank and 
because the t the drum takes up so much of the volume, you don't actually need as many chemicals. Um, you can use a lot less chemicals with it too, which is pretty cool. You just have the emulsion side in, facing uh, in? The emulsion side uh, out, yeah, in, in the taco part. So yeah. um, when you slide it in, you just make sure the emulsion side's like in, in the taco part and then it'll, it'll fill uh -huh. it as it goes through. Cool, interesting. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Dave swears by them. He was the one that recommended them to check them out, and I really enjoyed it. Do they make them for eight by ten? I wonder. No, yeah. they only go up to five by seven, and then nine by twelve. Oh, that's what you were talking about. I gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> Steam tank for, um, and then Pete uh, Gamascus, um he's in New Hampshire and he does a lot of five by seven, four by five and eight by 10, but he's a wild man and he does it in trays. Mm -hmm. I was doing okay with it, but it just like wasn't consistent. And if I'm going to spend that kind of money, I don't want to be messing up the developing. That's fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Large, large format is not a cheap game. Got it. It pains, well, right now I don't have a dark room and I haven't figured out the developing for 8x10, but it's really hard to send in black and white 8x10 because of how much it costs. I developed, do you right now? I'm doing Northeast Photographic, which I don't, I heard about them, I think it was from Brian Burke's channel and then AJ Holmes, who had, like I asked him for some advice and he was super helpful. He uses them too, but I think I spent like $170 and I had like four sheets of color four by five and maybe like four black and white eight by 10. And I was like, man, I'm excited to shoot more, but I can't pay for it right now. Um, maybe try hitting up Brian and Jesse at Underdog Film Lab. Okay. They're out, they're out in Oakland, um, but they're, they're great and their prices are pretty reasonable. Um, and they do most of their stuff mail in and both of them are shooters. Like they're, they're like, Brian's like, you know, a fantastic friend and Jesse's like a super talented, uh, photographer and lab tech and, um, underdog's been taking out pretty good. So they might be worth like hitting them up and, uh, seeing what they would charge for, for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I might consider that. And for sure, like I have no interest developing color or scanning color. So. I could always scan my own black and white, but. Yeah, you don't want to like, you know, try the joys of, of developing color sheets. Mm -mm. No way. <laughs> I'm like the person who I'm like, uh, it's relatively close with black and white, it'll be fine. Like, I don't worry about it too much, but color seems stressful. Yeah, I've never tried color because like, I just feel that way, like that it, color feels stressful, like. Mm -hmm. Black and white's easy. There's a lot of latitude where it's like, if you fuck part of the process up, you probably won't destroy much of the film. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little pissed at myself though, because the last four by five run that I did, I thought that it was Rolly 400. So I shot it as Rolly 400. And then I developed it as Rolly 400. And then when I pulled the negatives out of the tank, I was like, this is not Rolly 400. <laughs> oh. It turned out it was Ag for Chrome 50. Um, so Very I good. fucked that up a lot because, you know, I shot a 50 ISO film at 400 and uh, then processed a color film black and white. <laughs> oh, man. Yikes. <laughs> there was still an image there, though. I haven't really been able to get much out of it, though. Yeah. Even shooting color is stressful for me because I'm like, I'm a black and white person. So I'm like, well, I better have a really good reason for shooting color when I would probably prefer it in black and white. So that's I, true. I was too busy thinking like, I don't know how to shoot color. I'm so stressed out. Um, Danielle says developing color is super stressful. I know she had a lot of issues with it. I think now she sends it out because she was just like, this is ridiculous. Well, I, I send mine out too, mostly because I'm just lazy. Like, I like the dev part. I enjoy 
developing and doing that. I just don't like scanning. Mm -hmm. I, 35 I, meters flatbed scanning is, I hate it. Yeah, it's annoying. I, <laughs> I'm going to give um, digital scanning a try, like with like DSL, like the SLR scanning, mm -hmm. and to see if that makes me hate it less. Um, I doubt it's going to, though. I, um, yeah, Danielle's like, absolutely, the lab can deal <laughs> with the stress. I ain't got time for that. Totally. <laughs> Agreed. Like they can totally, like they can totally have that. Even the scanning, I've heard just nightmares, and I'm like, I am not even interested. Dude, le oh, Aaron says he loves digital scanning, so that's good to know. So, with this next project you're you're working on, like, um, is the the goal to ult ultimately like turn that into a book or like a like a showing or? Probably, I would love to do both. Um, I feel like books have so much more of a lasting effect than like exhibitions, which I really like. Um, especially as just like a record of a like particular segment of a community. Um, but I would, I definitely want to do it as a project for a very long time. Like this last summer, I spent a lot of weekends being like, oh, well, it's Wednesday, but what are you saying to my wife? Like, what do you think about driving to Ohio and then Virginia this weekend? Like, we just have to be back by Sunday. We could leave Friday after work. So, like, I just have to find more time to either keep doing that, and it would be nice to find some sort of funding so that I could have some help building that body of work. Otherwise, it would just take me a lot longer. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. But I definitely want to keep doing a lot more of it. What, like, what if you maybe did it as like an ongoing series where you have like volumes of, of them and you kind of like put a book out of like, you know, one series and then like sort of evolve it and you could have like a whole compendium of, of the project. Yeah, that would be really cool. Like one thing I struggled with is, I don't know, you hear things like if you're building a body of work, like you shouldn't share it all the time. But so much of like finding other people is networking. And I found most of the people that I have photographed through Instagram. So you kind of have to like show your work in order to show people what you're looking to do. Well, and I kind of feel like that's maybe a bit more of like a, like an old school mentality. Like you hear of like some of these people who like now are getting some like, you know, acclaim where it's like they've been shooting for the last like 40, 50 years, never shared anything. And then like someone like, you know, heard about them and was like, holy shit, like this person has this cache of like all these amazing photos. And it's like, well, you, know, you could have been like sharing them, like connecting with people for like years now but you know you're doing it in like your last years and mm -hmm. like to your point like you, most of the people you've connected with have been through Instagram like it's important to share to be able to to connect through that and engage with people like mm -hmm. uh, I think I would disagree with with that sort of mind uh, like mindset around that where um, I think you should share it's important to share mm -hmm. yeah I've kind of come to that conclusion but definitely like had that thought in the back of my head too yeah because it's like how, how else are you going to find people to collaborate with and um also just people to connect with in general because like your photos have such a such an engaging feel to them that like i would imagine there's so many people out there that maybe stumble across your photos and feel like an immediate connection to them mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you have like people reaching out to you because like, you know, your photos have, have made them feel certain ways about like, you know, their life experiences or things like that. Mm -hmm. The coolest part totally is, which sounds so cliche, but like going out and meeting these people, like I'm a super shy person, like the thought of, well, driving a long ways to meet somebody that I've never spoken with and like have deep conversations with is like unheard of for me a couple years ago, but people are so like generous 
um, like open with their experiences and how they're feeling, like just being totally truthful and I don't know, just being excited to connect with other queer people, especially in rural areas. Like you don't have that extremely visible, obvious community that some people have like in a bigger city. So there definitely is community in rural spaces, but it's definitely not as visible or as abundant as a city, let's say. Yeah, and the, I think um, this this might be a, a friend of yours here or something saying, so much of this is way over my head, but so interesting to get little tidbits of aha moment. Yeah, I love Kelly, she's so sweet. She always listens to me blab on about camera stuff. <laughs> Oh, and camera stuff is interesting. Um, they're an important tool. And um, there's plenty of, of podcasts out there that get like super deep into um, the merits of gear and like how gear works and, and things like that. And um, I, I feel like I've kind of avoided getting into that too much. Like it's fun to have gear talk every once in a while, but I like, um, learning more about the people mm -hmm. there's there's tons of other like podcasts and interviews and things out there where you can learn about gear but I kind of find it more interesting to learn about learn about the people and learn their stories and um, hear about their experiences and stuff and like I've found that way more enjoyable through this series than um, you know jerking off about the merits of like Leica over Nikon or Canon Mm -hmm. totally. Well, you have that it's like same experience, like what I was talking about, like the joy is connecting with other people. Absolutely. And like it's Instagram has been um, a wicked important conduit for me the last few years. Like um, I, I've gotten into some interesting discussions with people when like, yeah, there's there's lots of people I've had conversations with where they condemn social media and like, you know, proclaim it to be toxic for a plethora of reasons. And I, I don't disagree with, with some of that for sure, but um, I have a different feel around like Instagram because um, I don't feel it as a toxic thing for me anymore. I have had toxic relationships with Instagram in the past where I didn't understand a good way to engage with it and a good way to use it as a tool to connect to people. But mm -hmm. in the past few years where like, you know, I've learned how to, to harness it a little bit better as like a way to connect with interesting people and, um, you know, tap into a community. Um, it's become a really valuable tool for that where, you know, I've been able to connect with people that I never would have been able to had it not been for a tool like this. Mm -hmm. 100% agree and it's really cool to see like how genuine people are like within a community that you just meet via the internet it's almost yeah. like the opposite of all of the stranger danger like internet scare like growing up with the internet <laughs> and that's out there but it's cool to see the good side of it too I mean it could also be like my age like I, I grew up when the internet was just kind of like launching as, as a thing. So like there was no YouTube when I was on the internet and um, there was some sketchy stuff on there for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's things I've seen that will never, never leave me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been interesting to see like the progression of these, these platforms too. Like, I mean, shit. Um, I used to use MySpace all the time before Facebook was even a thing. And mm -hmm. so it's just like, it's weird to think now that like that kind of stuff no longer exists. And like, you know, we're in this metaverse world now. Oh, God. <laughs> um, what, what are your thoughts on that? How excited are you to like don a VR helmet on to like interact with people in your world? I will 100% refuse. I am like... So old school jaded, like all the virtual crap, like, I mean, I feel like that kind of plays into why I like analog photography is like, I like doing things like in the physical world, 
not like I don't want to sit in front of my computer screen, whether it's my computer or whether I'm wearing it, you know? So. Well, I'm, I, I agree with that too. Like, I think that's why I really love, um, or that's what really got me in, into the Polaroids was it's just a real tangible thing. And it's something that you can create a connection in a moment with someone with a Polaroid and then just hand it to them. And now they have this thing versus like, you know, you, you grab your phone and you, you take a selfie with someone and then it's just another bunch of digital pixels that get lost in uh, someone's photo folder until they're like, oh shit, I'm out of space and I need to delete things. And that uh -huh. set of pixels gets deleted to make way for the next Drake album. Yeah, totally. Which I just, I mean, all that plays into like print your work and all that stuff. Like my favorite thing to do that I've the last couple of years is like make a yearly photo album. And I love to like not shut up about it, but I tell all my <laughs> friends, like my friends just got back from vacation and I'm like, okay, well, are you going to print all these photos? Like I'm going to yell at you until you do it because your little baby is going to need to see photos of you when you were little. So I'm going to keep yelling. Yeah. But. Well, I mean, that kind of stuff is really important. And, um, there's a, a project she just told me to print my pixels today. That's what I just told literally like an hour ago. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, there's a, a collective that I'm part of that um, my friend Becca started called Northern Film Collective. And um, she founded it because um, she saw there's a lot of like Instagram groups for American photographers and American photography, but not much for Canadian. So she started this like Canadian focus group. And one of the big um, initiatives that she put together with the project was this idea of creating a yearly volume of Canadian film photography. Um, so we launched volume one last year and um, it was a really cool project. Like we had an open submissions for people to like mail in photos. And um, we had, I think almost, near 70 photographers from all over Canada submit photos and we made um, it was like 130 or 140 page book of like all of this Canadian film photography and um, it was just really cool um, to be part of that and to share that with with all these people because a, a lot of these people are just Instagram photographers that probably haven't printed much of their stuff and mm -hmm. you know this could be the one time that their stuff gets published in something. And now they have like, they could like show people, this is my book. And like, you know, I'm in here and like, check out these photos. And we're working on volume two right now, which um, she's just got submissions going for that and uh, collecting photos from people uh, from all over the country again. And, and looking forward to see what that volume looks like. Cause it's just, it's important to like get stuff out there and like have this, um, this collection of, um, of works. And um, I, I bought an extra copy of it when we did the run so that I can um, donate it to the Toronto Library so that they oh. can have it in there. So it's like, you know, it's the Canadian work. That's a great idea. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I'm sure there's like probably some group out there that's um, doing something similar for like uh, American photographers, like, you know, for any Canadian folks listening, feel free to like hit up Northern Film Collective and, and do that. Um, also on the American Pals, if you have any photos of Canada, the only stipulation of it is the photos have to be of Canada. Cool. So you can submit stuff there. Do you do more like zine, like soft cover or is it hard cover? Um, it was, it was a soft cover, but it was a big boy. Like it was, it was a thick guy. Um, and we did the, the soft cover just to keep costs down. But the idea is, <clears throat> um, we'll do the yearly volumes as like a big project. Um, and then probably next year, like we just with COVID and everything, like it was hard to like get shit together to do other stuff. But, 
um, we wanted to do like smaller series of like zine type books where we would have like a small like project idea where people can like you know contribute things to it and we put together like like a small zine that would be like maybe like you know 15 20 bucks or something and very cool it's so fun putting all that together i haven't really done anything like zine like the only stuff i've really done is through like a i think i've done blurb where you pretty much like just plug your photos in kind of a thing Blurb is pretty cool. Like that's what I use for a lot of my printing. I don't like, like their book right software is great. Don't get me wrong. Um, I haven't really liked it. So like when I use Blurb, I do stuff in InDesign and then upload the InDesign stuff into Blurb. And I've been really happy with their stuff. Like their, their trade books are a really good affordable way to like make stuff there. Cause their mm -hmm. eight by 10 uh, trade book the print quality is pretty decent on it. And if you're doing the paperback instead of the hardcover, it's also pretty economical to put that together. And so if you've never put together um, any of your photography as like a, a photo works and you wanted to make like a small photo book to share with friends, but you didn't want to break the bank on it, the, the trade book is a great way to go. Cause um, when I did my first book, um, I did a couple um, printed as photo books and a bunch printed as the trade books. And the trade books were like half the cost of the actual photo book style ones. And I personally kind of like the way the trade book looked more than the, the photo book. Mm -hmm. Is that the one that's like, it's more magazine like, right? No, it's so that, that's an even different one. You can get the one that's more like, um, there's like the the magazine style one that has like the it's like a even softer style cover where it it feels like a magazine. The trade mm -hmm. book is more like a soft cover book. Okay. So that this is what like I made one of our wedding week of photos and it's kind of like magazine. Maybe it's their trade book though. Yeah. If it if the um. If the cover paper is like a bit thicker stock, then that's yeah. the trade book. Okay, it is a trade. Book. Yeah, the, they do have a magazine style one that has like a really like the cover is is really soft, like a magazine cover would be. And I helped a friend do a project on that style, and that turned out pretty good too. Like that had a like pretty cool feel to it as well. Um, but yeah, Blurb is a great place to start if you want to just experiment and like fuck around with stuff. And like Dave's book, he did it through Blurb. And a big part of it was um, the distribution side of it too. Like if you don't wanna have to deal with the shipping and doing all that kind of stuff, like you upload your project into the Blurb market, uh, marketplace and then people just buy it from Blurb and Blurb does all the credit processing and shipping and all that kind of stuff, so. Which is so nice reduces a lot of headache for sure. And also reduces your costs because you don't have to like print a book and like get it to your own place and do all the shipping yourself. You could just be like, I made something, now go buy it from Blurb. Yeah. yeah. Someday. Someday? Yeah, when I'm ready. <laughs> you gotta take your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna make a lot more. How many, do you know? Like, I know Dave worked on it for a couple of years. How many portraits are in his book? Oh, man. I can't remember now. I wish I was at home because um, I could tell you. Because I can't even remember how many pages was in it. I'll find out when I get it, too, but just curious. It's a. It's definitely, I think, over 30. Okay. Um, and I like how he did it. It's just the photos and page numbers. So there's not a lot of distraction as you're browsing through it. And then if you're curious about who the person was, um, there's like a legend at the back of the book where you can like look up the um, page number and like, you know, see who that person was. And then he has their, if they shared it, he has their Instagram and their website back there too. Okay. So it's not like the photographers like reflected at all either. It's kind of just like the portraits, very simple. Yeah, it's just just straight up the portrait because 
that's what he wanted the book to be was just it's a portrait of a photographer and, mm -hmm. uh, you know because most of the time we're just lurking behind the lines yeah and, uh, he's like come out of the shadows i want, yeah. to, I want people to see who you are <laughs> totally Have yeah you... and, oh sorry go ahead but your portrait taken by him was that the only time you've had your portrait taken on large format no okay um that's the first time I've ever had a, a portrait taken with the purpose of it being published. Um, but I've had like uh, Armand at the Denton Camera Exchange, he's done some eight by 10 portraits for me on Polaroid, um, which is like, that's one of the, my favorite things of going down to Policon every year is getting the eight by 10 Polaroid from Armand. Uh -huh. um, He's, he's great with that. Um, Ellen Wishart did a uh, tintype um, portrait for me at Policon as well. And uh, Brian did another tintype for me too. And Project Barbatype did one for me, which was, was really cool because they were the only ones that let me wear my glasses for the tintype. Because mm -hmm. um, Ellen and Brian made me take my glasses off because they were worried about reflection. But the Barbatype guys were like, fuck it, let's try it. Let's see how it turns out. And that's that's a pretty cool photo, too, because it, it looks like like a class photo from, like, the 1950s almost. <laughs> and that used to be, like, my corporate, like, icon that I would have for, like, when I would pop into Zoom meetings and shit. I just, uh -huh. I just used that one. Cool. I always like to ask people, like, after I take their portrait, I feel like most people do not like having their portrait taken. So I always like to ask if they felt like it felt different having your portrait taken like with this particular camera versus anything else. That's an interesting question. Like, how do most people respond to that? I'd say, well, I nobody would, hasn't said yet, like, well, that was terrible. But <laughs> I feel like it feels different. It feels less like you're being stared at maybe because it's not like you're you're doing other things you know you're getting stuff set up so you're chatting a little bit too and it feels less like somebody's just like click clicking away at you yeah it is a very different process because like you're not taking a photo with a large format camera like you're making a photo so you have to put a lot more attention into it and, and spend more time and like one thing I've kind of found interesting is people that aren't used to or have never had like a large format photo taken of them sometimes get a little impatient because they're just like, it, has it happened yet? Is it done? <laughs> like, what, what are you doing? I'm like, it takes some time to like make sure I got the focus and everything set right. And yeah. Like, yeah. I feel like I haven't really had that happen yet. Maybe the only reason would be if it was like really cold out and then mm -hmm. I freezing. We're going into the winter here, actually, and I'm kind of like, there aren't a ton of places for me to take portraits inside. So am I just going to have to freeze if I want to take photos during the winter? Or you might just need to build a studio. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do have a skylight. Our bedroom is like a finished attic, so we have a skylight. I do need to figure out how to, like, make that work or utilize that but i haven't figured it out yet have you um have you played with strobes at all yet with your large format cameras nope not at all that might be something to try out because um i found they work really well like i picked up um some old alien bees b800s and you can usually find them pretty cheap, but like there's tons of stuff out there. Like people sell off their like old Ellen Chrome stuff and, and whatnot really cheap. But for a few hundred bucks, you should be able to find like a strobe or two. And that might make indoor portraits um, a little easier. That's true. Yeah. Nico said you need powerful strobes. Yeah, I, the B800 will work. That's like kind of like, um, probably the lowest you, you go for that yeah the einsteins are those are like the newer the newer one to the b800s but um if you're buying like the the new einsteins you're going to be 
you're gonna be spending some some Boku bucks. Yeah. But if I ever want to get into wet plate, I know I'm gonna need light light strobes, whatever it is. Oh but. my god, you need to have like the things that like you know give people sunburn. Like <laughs> <laughs> those those things are crazy. Like when you get into the the wet plate stuff, like uh -huh. yeah. You're just like basically pointing like bare strobes like right in someone's face. Have you ever heard of um, Blackhand? I think her name's Carla Rodriguez from Minneapolis. No. She's a wet plate artist <clears throat> and she has a studio up there and I want to go up and have her take my portrait but I'm excited to see like the types of lights because I think she was talking about maybe on some podcasts just how people are like holy crap. Yeah, well, it's like like Brian, my my friend in Elgin, like his setup is he has this old like setup from like I think it was uh, when like from old school photos kind of things, like what the Jostens guys used to like truck around. So he's got like the big like control box with like all the wires that go out to like the the strobes, and mm -hmm. uh, he has they're like this close to your face basically. So it's just like, <laughs> like maybe that's why he doesn't want you to wear the wear glasses because you'll have like burn marks from oh yeah <laughs> so <laughs> totally yeah, that'd be cool have you so you haven't gotten a wet plate photo of yourself done yet no there's um a wet plate artist in madison who does a lot of he doesn't really do portraiture but he does like still life stuff so he was at the um at the art fair on the square so i bought this tin type from him that was like super cool i was maybe going to you can see the reflection yeah um, that's cool i like that yeah i was maybe going to take a workshop from him if he has one sometime soon very so, cool yeah uh -huh. wet plate is such a neat process i'm it's the newest thing that i'm like i really have to figure that out because it looks so cool i mean kind of like polaroid where you're making like a one-off like unique object and that's really cool well and the other thing that's cool with with like the tin types is um it's one of the most longest lasting um types like of photos that you can make because it's it's happening at like a molecular level so you're like you're bonding the photo to like the trophy plate and so as long as you don't scratch the plate, like it'll, it'll last for thousands of years. Um, huh. So it's like, if you coat the plate, then like that photo will last forever. So cool. Yeah. You don't have to worry about fading with the tin type. Mm -hmm. Totally. So I just have a lot to figure out with that. Cause for somebody who's not very technical, it's, it seems intimidating with all the different chemistry. So yeah, but I mean, you could also look at it from the angle of, like, for someone that's not very technical, you're not going in there with a head full of other jargon that'll, like, you know, mix things up. You could just go in there and be like, I'm here to learn this process and, uh -huh. uh, you know, just attack it without having, like, other thoughts in your mind being like, well, if I do that, you know, what will this turn into? And mm -hmm. That's true. Just and if you do the cyanide oh. developing one, just don't drink the developer. That is important. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have to figure out I have to have really good ventilation in my dark room so that's what I'm trying to figure out right now like you have to have I think I calculated I need 108 cubic feet per minute for my dark room fan if I wanted to do wet play oh wild so trying to find a good fan for that hmm yeah, Waster Silver says dry glass definitely is easier, but doesn't look like wet plates. Mm -hmm. and I did try a dry plate once, but I definitely like haven't really given it the time of day. I've been thinking of like mucking around with shooting just regular negative paper and then. Um, exposing that like negative paper onto another negative to see if I could make an image out of it. Just cause I have all of this like extra paper kicking around that I need to do something with. Have you tried that? Yeah. I've not tried it yet. It's something I want to try. 
but the thing is I need to get an eight by 10 camera before I do that because all of the paper I have is eight by 10. So it's, um, it's on the list of like cameras to get soon. Cause, um, I, I want to start doing eight by 10 Polaroids and I have everything to do with eight by 10 Polaroids except for the camera. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at all or just letting it kind of happen if it does? kind of looking but also kind of letting it happen and a friend of mine was teasing me with his deer dwarf recently he's like oh i have a deer dwarf 8x10 i haven't used it in years though and it's like would you ever sell it ah oh, probably not i don't know <laughs> and the last time i was visiting with him he's like hey come downstairs i want you to see something and did he have a book? He pulls the deer dwarf out and he's like, what do you think of this guy? And I'm like, I think you're really mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool though. How do you see that? It's a beautiful camera. Like it, um, it has such a cool feel to it. Um, yeah. I, if I was to get an eight by 10, like, and money was no object, I would definitely like want to track down a deer dwarf, but. Mm -hmm. I was look when I was scouring eBay, I did see, I think it was a deer dwarf not too far from me, but it was like a project one. It definitely needed to be restored, but it still was really expensive. And I was like, man, I can't buy that. I know it's a deer dwarf, but I don't know. Yeah, they're, they're expensive, sadly. <laughs> you're, you're to cut paper <laughs> yeah i nico's like you can cut paper i'm like but i'm lazy um <laughs> would you how would you even do that without like a dark room would you have to do that in a changing bag yeah i wouldn't want to do it i so i hate changing bags because they give me wicked anxiety because i don't like when my hands start to become a different temperature from the rest of my body uh -huh. and so it's like after a few minutes inside of the bag, my hands start to warm up. And then I, all of a sudden I just get really anxious and I just want to rip my hands out of the bag because I'm like, this is uncomfortable. I don't like it. Uh -huh. But like, I can't pull them out of the bag until I'm done doing the thing that I need to do. <laughs> so then it just becomes this like race. I'm like, I need to finish this thing before I start like having an anxiety attack. Um, which makes me miss having a dark room because, um, I used to like doing more dev stuff when I had access to a dark room, even though it was a creepy fucking dark room, because it was in the basement of this old ass warehouse building that I'm pretty sure had ghosts. And oh. um, the like the dark change room was this like tiny little closet room that had like a 20 foot ceiling inside of it. So it was like this little room with like a huge ceiling that um, was pretty creepy. And most of the time I'd go there, it would be like at night. So it was like by myself in this warehouse building mm -hmm. in a dark room all by myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that's what I would feel like when I would be tray developing because I'd be like in my dark room in the pitch black. And it's like in my apartment, not really spooky. But when you're in the pitch black for like 30 minutes, it can get a little spooky, especially for somebody who thinks goosebumps is spooky. <laughs> You're like, I know there's no ghosts in my apartment, but I turned the lights out and it's been half an hour. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Where is it? Nico says, check out the Sinar Norma. Hmm. I might have to look into that. It will be have the uh, Sinar shutter. Hmm. Especially someday, I want to get a brass lens someday. I think that would be really cool. Like a really old one from like the 1800s or something. Yeah, so I've got, like that's another portrait that was a really cool one that um, like a, a favorite portrait's taken. My friend Jeremy, who I interviewed recently, Jeremy Lynch, um, it was an interesting chat with him but he does portraits with a five by seven camera from the 1800s that was built in Berlin by a guy who, when he wasn't building cameras, he was part of the Berlin uh, ballet group. He was a ballet dancer that oh. also made cameras. 
Cool. And so he's got this old wooden five by seven from the eighteen hundreds with the the brass lens that has no shutter in it. So he just has this like cap that goes over it, and he just pulls the cap off, and you know, one one hundred, two one hundred, like <laughs> puts it back on. And he took your portrait with that. He did. So that's how I met him. Um, was he was taking portraits in Vancouver or not in Toronto for um, a project um, of like car drivers versus cyclists versus humans kind of thing. And he was interviewing people on what their thoughts about cars were. And uh, he categorized people into like car people, bike people and like, you know, walkers kind of thing. And uh, he made this like book series of um, he would cut the faces into threes. So there'd be like the, the top half, the eyes, and then the mouth. And he would jumble the faces together to create new faces. With them. And uh, before he did the book project, um, he posted his jumble faces uh, with wheat paste all over the city of Toronto. Um, so they're pro I know they're still because he's like posted some new ones. So there's like pieces of my face wheat pasted all over <laughs> Toronto and, you know, dozens of maybe even hundreds of other people that he shot as well, because he was just set up in Kensington Market, which is like a big public space um, in downtown Toronto. And he was just set up there for months, like taking people's portraits um, and interviewing them about this thing. Um, you can check out his stuff. He's Jumble Face Photo, uh, <laughs> F-O-T-O. And uh, yeah, like that was a really cool camera um, and a neat experience because <laughs> I was I was walking around um, Toronto with my friend Amy before I moved and I was just kind of like, I don't really feel connected Toronto to, to Toronto. So like, you know, I don't think I'm going to feel much when, when I move away. And she was like, what the fuck are you talking about? what do you mean she's like for someone that doesn't feel connected to this fucking city you're sure part of it and i'm like what do you mean she's like well as we've been walking she's like i've seen like a whole bunch of your stickers posted on things and she's like i've seen your face in like four different places so she's like you know you may not feel connected to the city but the city is definitely connected to you whether you like it or not yeah and it just kind of happened um which is like an interesting thing. Like, you know, sometimes it's it's fun to take like random leaps of faith um, and just, you know, you see that guy with the weird old camera and taking people's pictures. Maybe you go say like, hey, what's up? <laughs> and see what happens instead of like, I think a, a shyer me would have just been like, that's neat, but then just sort of like slunked away and like, you know, mm -hmm. engage. The stories you remember where you're, you do something like out of your comfort zone. Yeah, and then you have no idea where that will take you as well. Like, it's um, it's fascinating where you can end up sometimes, good and bad, if you step out of your comfort zone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always worth it, though. I'm like that kind of person who's always like, well, like, it may be crazy to do this, but, like, I mean, that's what life's about. Yeah, I mean, as long as you don't die, it's, it's worth it. Uh -huh. True, for the most part. Or, I mean, if you do end up dying, you know, hopefully it was something that was, like, completely worth it. <laughs> it's like, no regrets. Uh -huh. No regrets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I totally spaced out on the question I had there. All right, that's my bad on that one. No worries. Um, but yeah, I just want to say like, I've really appreciated um, hanging out with you and chatting with you. Um, yeah, it was a good, I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking. Of, of course, like I really, I liked your work. Like I felt really drawn to it and I was very curious about it. So um, I wanted to learn more about you and uh, you know, I have this great platform where I can bait strangers to talk to me. <laughs> Yeah, which is and, cool. like what, oh, a, what a cool thing to do and like skill to have like you could talk to anybody. Yeah, it's and it, it has been kind of cool 
because there have been a few people that I never really would have imagined having a conversation with through this that were like, yeah, totally. And um, some other people who I thought have been amazing that haven't really had much exposure or anything that I've been able to like, you know, put out there and like introduce to a bunch of people. So it's been a fun, it's been a fun platform to have to, to connect with people and um, a great excuse to like hit up strangers being like, Hey, I might be a bit of a weirdo, but I do this thing every week where I talk to strangers and sometimes yeah. friends and you want to be one of those people. <laughs> totally. That's awesome. I mean, it's just like asking a portrait or asking a stranger to take their portrait. It's like, I'm the weird person with the camera, but it, like, it's an excuse to talk to them. Absolutely. Uh -huh. But I, I wanted to say thank you for spending some time with me. I know we've been talking for, for quite a bit of time uh, here already. And um, I'm starting to lose track of my thoughts. So because it's probably <laughs> a, a good time to uh, put a bow on it. Um, did you have any final remarks you'd like to share with, uh, with the folks here? I don't think so. It's been fun, like chatting and seeing what people have said. So it's been awesome. I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. If you ever are up in uh, British Columbia, like Vancouver area, or if you're even in Seattle at some point, um, let me know. It'd be cool to meet up in the real world and go shoot some photos. Yeah, for sure. Probably more likely Seattle than British Columbia, but I'll let you know if I'm out that way. Yeah, I've got a bunch of pals in Seattle. So hopefully like border restrictions will loosen up a little bit more where it'll make it a little more reasonable to travel over because uh, mm. still still a little weird right now but um yeah seattle is definitely something that i'm itching to hit up because um a, a good film friend of mine uh, film diary of a redhead she just relocated to the pacific northwest so cool. looking forward to go hang out with them there yeah uh, but yeah thank you for hanging out with me and everyone thank you for tuning in and spending time with us um next week i'm going to have uh my heterosexual life mate, Chris Elvis Cohen on. He's one of my oldest friends and an adventure buddy and a curmudgeon and uh, all around fun, lovable guy. <laughs> and um, I'm excited that I finally convinced his grumpy ass to do an episode with me. So um, we'll probably talk about our road trip adventures and uh, how much we hate things and uh, our mutual love for Dairy Queen, which neither of us can eat now because we're both chunky guys. So <laughs> <laughs> that should be a fun episode. Cool. But yeah, awesome. thank you for hanging out with me and uh, you know, everyone stay safe out there and uh, we'll see you next week. Awesome. See ya. Thanks so much. Take care, sir. Have a great weekend. Bye. Okay. Bye everyone.